From Labradoodles to Cronuts, the world loves a hybrid. So today, businesses are taking a smarter hybrid cloud approach using the tools, platform, and expertise of IBM. The world is going hybrid with IBM. Visit ibm.com slash hybrid cloud. Empire. Hello and welcome to my podcast, sponsored by Lono Coffee. Visit LonoCoffee.com, use promo code COFFEE2020 for a discount. They have some good holiday gifts on there for you too. Today, I have a special guest, former Washington great John Riggins. I love this conversation. We talk a little bit about Chase Young, Antonio Gibson, but he also talks about halftime adjustments, having played for a guy whose staff was terrific at making them. Rigo takes us inside the locker room when Gibbs was in charge. And he talks about the one time he confronted Joe Gibbs with a demand slash request. It didn't happen often, folks. That's why I said one time. Good stuff. And former NFL scout Tyler Roman returns with some fantasy football insight, plus a quick conversation on DK Metcalf and Terry McLaurin. Roman scouted both players before the 2019 draft. You can listen to Riggins' new podcast, which he does with Dexter Manley. It's called The John Riggins Show. It's available on multiple podcast platforms. It's also available on YouTube. You can read my work on ESPN.com. I have a story up now about Washington's defense and why they have improved. It's more than just young, as I'm sure you know. You can follow Tyler Roman on Twitter at NFL Scout 21 and now, here's my conversation with Hall of Famer and ex-Washington running back, John Riggins. I'm joined by John Riggins. And John, I want to get to your podcast in a few minutes because I think it's a fun one. It shows your personality. Fans would enjoy it. But I do want to ask you a few other questions before we get to that point. I'm going to start off with Ron Rivera. Is this a guy, based on what you've seen and know about him, is this a guy, a coach that you would have liked to play for? You know, it's hard for me to answer that question, John, because you have to be on the inside to sure. what goes on out there, you know. But you have to, I mean, from the outside looking in, you would say yes. First of all, he's a former player. So, you know, from that perspective, you'd kind of go, well, he's different than some coaches. Coach Gibbs was not a former player, but that, you know, obviously he had great success and he had a lot of respect from his team. Uh, I think that Ron is accomplishing the same thing. And, you know, you, you look at the year that he's had so far, you know what, you really got to take your hat off because, you know, he goes through chemotherapy for about the first third of the season. He comes out on the other side of that. You know, the team was playing so-so. I mean, there was a lot of, you know, and the other, the, there's always the big question is how much autonomy does Ron Rivera have? I mean, you can look at it and kind of go, well, I don't know, because obviously he starts the season with Dwayne Haskins after three games, so he decides at four, whatever it was, decides he's seen enough. He switches to Kyle Allen. Kyle Allen gets hurt under Alex Smith. Now they're kind of they're back to right. Wayne Haskins. So in other words, the quarterback play has been anything but, you know, solidified because you've had so many different actors back there. But at the same time, I, I get the feeling that the team, you know, they're playing with spirit. And, you know, I think that's a reflection on the head coach. So, you know, like I said, I think that he's, he's doing a good job. And you bring up the reflection of the head coach and you play for a guy, obviously, who had great success here. What what happens when a team? Why does it how does a team take on the personality of a coach from your experience? Well, you know, I I'm not really the greatest guy to talk to about this. And I'll tell you why, because I kind of was an isolated type of player. And really, I didn't look to a head coach or any coach for that matter to get me ready to play. And in all honesty, for what I did, which is basically run a football and know a few places, you know, blocking assignments, there really wasn't much a coach was going to tell me that that I felt like he knew more about it than I did because he didn't, he'd never done it. So it's kind of hard to take advice from somebody that has never done what you're doing. Um, but at the same time, you know, you look at how everybody else reacts. And I think some some player, um, and I played for enough head coaches, and I'm going to use Joe Gibbs as an example, that, you know, some players really, I think, and I didn't have a problem with it. Joe and I, I think, had a tacit understanding that I'll stay out of his hair and he'll stay out of mine, and it worked out great. Uh, but there are a lot of players that need that, you know, a coach to tell them this or that or whatever. 
and I wasn't one of those guys. So, I mean, uh, I, I, and I think that it takes a special coach to know which players do and which don't. And, you know, and that's what I think one of, you know, Joe Gibbs is great gifts is he knew the guys that needed a little, you know, a little pat on the back. He knew the guys that needed a little kick in the rear. And he knew the guys that just leave them alone. They'll be fine. I think hopefully Ron Rivera is that very same guy. But, you know, and it's funny with Joe Gibbs, I think it, it may have been Joe Bugle. When he when Joe came back the second time, I remember talking to Joe Bugle and you came up and he would talk about how Joe was always he wasn't sure how to confront you or to deal with you. So he kind of let others do it. But that seemed to let you be you. Yeah. And I think that's exactly the way it was. There was except the only time, you know, this is, and I think you're probably aware of this. But it was the week before the playoffs started, that first Super Bowl run in 17. I was riding out, you know, to the park, and I was starting to think of all the possibilities because when I first came into the league, really the only the only goal I really had or was something I wanted to do was play in a Super Bowl. For some reason, that was, you know, I didn't I wasn't necessarily win a Super Bowl. I just wanted to play in one see what it was like. And I, I got so emotionally lifted by this ride out there, it was on a day off to get treatment. Uh, we just played the San, uh, St. Louis Cardinals last game of the season. And we were playing Detroit on Saturday that I was just, I was just, I was ready to play when I got out of the car. So the first guy I see is Joe Bugle. And I said, Bugle, give me the ball. Because once again, basically, uh, you know, uh, echoing what you just said, that it was me, I was going to tell, you know, uh, John Alden to go tell Pocahontas that <laughs> you know, and so uh, Bugle's the first time I've ever seen him do that. It's the only time I'd ever seen him do it. He just he got real deadpan. He almost was really stern. He said, "Don't tell me. Go in and tell the old man." <laughs> Re referencing Gibbs, and Gibbs happened to be in the coach's locker room at the time, and he was in there by himself, which was kind of interesting. And I'd never been in the locker room before in my life, and I never had never went back to it. But I went, OK, so I went in and that was the only time, basically, that I guess you might say that we all got out of character. And I went in and I huh. told you exactly what I told Bugle. And as I tell people, I didn't get the impression that he was really moved by anything. That I did. <laughs> then you look back and you see where you average carrying the ball 36 times in four games and you're kind of going or 34, whatever it was. And I'm thinking, yeah, he must have heard something predicated <laughs> on the success we were having. And the other thing with, with those teams, too, where everybody always talk about halftime adjustments. And you look at this current team, their play before and after halftime is very, very different. And I know, like, the adjustments get made throughout the game. How big a deal was that for you guys at that time? Or why did you feel like those teams played so well in the second half? It was exactly what you said. I, you know, there's a couple things here. Once, once again, we're referencing Joe Gibbs, but. He had, you know, he's got that ability as the CEO, so to speak, to know that his foremans that he has, which would be his like his defensive coordinator in this case, which was Richie Pettibone, it was Richie's defense. I don't think, I mean, I never saw Joe Gibbs once leave one of our offensive meetings to go down and sit in with the defense. No, I don't remember. But then again, I was only there for four years with, with Joe. So maybe in subsequent years, maybe he did that. I doubt it. But he was able to go ahead and say, you, you know, you're the defensive coordinator. That's your department. You run it. I'm not going to meddle with it. And I think that he did a great job of that. So Richie would take the defense at halftime. He would go in and tell him exactly what needed to be done. And he told him, trust me, in completely different terms than what Coach Gibbs addressed. That's how he addressed that. uh, and uh, but Coach Gibbs, and this is always I tell people this. It was always kind of fascinating because when we come in at halftime, there was not. You know, a lot of times you might be down. You could be even up that couple touchdowns, you know. And uh, it was always like we were in a classroom. Hmm. And the professor was at the board. Joe Bugle would talk about the runs, both of them, Joe Bugle and Coach Gibbs. Coach Gibbs would start talking about the passing game. But it was like, you know, it was like a math teacher and you were, you know, doing something with algebra or whatever. They just started hmm. laying stuff out. There wasn't really any emotion. It was a business meeting you were having, at, uh, you know, at halftime. And I think that, you know, it was, I mean, occasionally, but it was happened very rarely that Coach Gibbs would raise his voice at halftime. You know, I remember one game in Philadelphia, he he got out of character, but, you know, played a lot of football to get that one moment, but, you know, where he was a little bit concerned with the way we were playing. What have, what have been your impressions of this group this year, just in watching them? You're talking about the team? Yes. Well, 
I don't. I think that offensively, you know, they're lacking, and they, but they're finding some. They're finding some uh, weapons. You know, they've got a little bit more than just uh, than McLaren now. McLaurin, um, you know, they found a running back. He's injured now, but he's still, you know, he's he's got some stuff going on. Um, they got a couple three running backs really that are more than adequate, really. Um, you know, and Logan Thomas has really come on as a tight end. Uh, their offensive line is doing an adequate job. The, the one place, obviously, the most critical place is your quarterback play, and you you got it's a little spotty there. But then you, know, you shift yourself to the other side, and you look at the defense. Well, obviously, at the beginning of the season, I think we all thought that defense is going to be really the thing that carried the team, and to the, for the most part, that's true. They've been spotty though, and I think that that's something obviously that can be corrected. But they're on. I, I don't. I don't want to be too premature and say they're on the verge of greatness, but I will say. I think they're capable of it at some point in time, but they've got to eliminate the inconsistency. They've got the, the up and down stuff. That should be a stone wall from the first when the ball is kicked off, or, or I mean, from the first down play from scrimmage to the last play of scrimmage, they should be a stone wall, and they're not. They, there's moments where they give up yards, running the ball, passing the ball, and yet there's moments where they just smother an offense. So once they get that ironed out, and I'm assuming they will, Washington, you know, they're going to become one of those teams. If you're an offensive player, you're going, oh, God, we got Washington this week. This ain't going to be no fun. Does Chase Young remind you of anybody? And you got a co-host who had a lot of sacks in his career. Yeah, and and here's what I would say, and I think that you have to include Montez Sweat in this conversation because to a certain extent, I think that he's – and he didn't – well, he was a, you know, what, uh, he was a middle – late, what, first-round draft pick? First-round pick, yeah. I know he's a first round pick. I didn't know exactly where he certainly wasn't the second pick overall, but he's been playing at the same level as Chase Young. Chase Young uh, this past week, you know, had a really good football game. Um, but to me, I and I think this is a great thing for Washington fans is you've got book and defensive ends. And I don't think you've had that since man and man. Correct. Uh, and I think that, you know, that really bodes well for the future. And then you go knock it down, you know, Go down to the B gap, and then you've got Payne and Allen, and you're going. You get a great, you know, defensive line, and I'm going to tell you something. You can win a lot of football games with, with that, and you get the linebackers, and then you get some offense. So I, there's a lot of there's a lot of I think there's more good going on than bad, and I can't you know there's I like I say the quarterback is the only position you look right. at where there's some inconsistency. Yeah, and and on offense, Antonio Gibson, the young running back, you referenced him earlier. Making that transition, what have been your impressions of him? He well, yeah, and he, he was a former running back or a wide receiver, which is interesting because you know you got Bobby Mitchell and Charlie Taylor, right. a couple of guys that made that conversion, uh, and they did it pretty well. Of course, they went from uh, running back to wide receiver, just the opposite. But that's that's the point is that he really has a, a unique perspective. I mean, I think you have to think of uh, Marshall Falk a little bit when you look at him because he is such a threat catching the ball, and certainly he can run the ball out of the backfield, and he just seems to keep improving at that all the time. And, you know, he just got to keep playing and staying on the field, and, uh, you know, he's going to develop into, a, I, I would think, a pretty good talent. Yeah, and, and you also play with a quarterback in Joe Theismann who went through something similar as far as the injury goes to Alex Smith. How surprised are you to see what Alex has? You're right. The quarterback play been up and down, but how surprised are you to see what he has been able to accomplish given the injury that was similar to Joe's? Yeah, it's, it, it, it's shocking really. I mean, there's two schools of thought here and I just, cause I've, I was one of those guys that, you know, based on, you know, having played 14 years and I think he's in his 15th. Is it his 15th? Yes. Year? <laughs> you know, I kind of go, uh, Based on if it had been John Riggins, let me put it to you that way, I would have been going, how much they owe me, how much, 71 million, right? Whether I step on the field or not, this is what I heard. You can correct me. No, that's right. And I'm thinking, I think I got a pretty good reason not to step on the field. <laughs> I think it's time to, uh, as they say in the Boy Scouts, be on the fire and go home. <laughs> John Riggins would be on the field. Now, if you've got a point to prove, which obviously Alex Smith does, uh, that's a different story. And, you know, you just have to say that it's nothing short of miraculous what he's been able to accomplish. And, you know, it really gets down to the player and only he knew for sure. And he had that confidence that the leg was fully rehabilitated. He's not exactly the same player that he was. 
but you know he he's getting along pretty doggone well really um i don't mind I me mean, i will say this i think it's kind of foolhardy to look at alex smith and think he's your quarterback in the future based right. on you know the fact that he's been around 15 years and it's not exactly like he's lighting things up as the quarterback of the present so but at the same time i think you've got to uh you got to give him you know the kudos and bon mots uh, i mean the kudos and bon mots for what he's accomplished so far because it is it's stunning what he's able to do would, would you have liked to have played during the era of social media uh no no that wouldn't work for me i have no i, I when i say i have no interest in it i i, I don't get it and uh what do you call it the uh, the computer age is a little bit past me the internet i'm I mean, about all I can use the internet for is basically if I want to, you know, look at fishing reels or, you know, in other words, I go online and go to some, it's basically like going to a sporting goods store without having to leave your house. But other than that, I think it would be, it would be difficult, I think, because players now are, there's a lot of them, and I don't know, but I, I, I'm pretty sure a lot of them are very connected in that world. And you can, I think you can really be influenced by it. And, you know, not necessarily in a positive way, because now all of a sudden you get instant gratification if you put something up there that people like. And, of course, you know, you're stoned if it, they don't like it. So I don't know. To me, it's like, yeah, I, I think it's kind of like, uh, what do you call it? Something that you, it's fun to look at, fun from being on the outside, but it's not anything that I would have particularly wanted to partake in. And it's funny you bring that up, because, like, I – on your podcast, I think you were talking about driving 18 hours with no music, nothing in the car, just driving. And not many people, I think, can can like that. Why do you like that kind of um, isolation, I guess? Because that's, that's you know, that's a long time without any anything like that. Let me say this, John. It's interesting, too, because I did, <clears throat> on the way out, I did that. And I did it on the way back. And I will be honest with you, I spent 12 nights out there sleeping on the prairie in Kansas, where I'm from. It was easier it got easier on the way home it was not even on the way out i thought yeah well i, I went yeah what the hell i'm not going and, 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 and like i said it got easier because i think that we live in a world where we're constantly being bombarded by information and 99 percent of it is pretty useless uh you spend 12 days by yourself someplace and uh, you don't have anybody to listen to talk to basically acapella i think is what the term is in music no accompaniment um you really start to see things in a clear way and perhaps you, you can see yourself even more objectively. And basically you're all, you're disappointed because you realize you're not as special as you thought you were. <laughs> and, and humility becomes a big part of it. And I think to, to lend a phrase from Plato when he was talking about Socrates, you end up, and I think Socrates when it says, I know that I know nothing. And that's basically what you come away with. And that's fine. You know, I think Dostoevsky said, be simple and rediscover the world. And to a certain extent, that's kind of what you do. And, and that's OK with me. Going to your podcast now, you and Dexter, you do, you've been doing the podcast, entertaining. Why do you why did you want to do it? And, and how much are you enjoying it? I will say, in all honesty, the motivation is financial. And right now, uh, where there's no been no payday. Uh, but uh, the other thing is this. Dexter is such an unusual guy in so many ways. Um, and he's really somebody that I've, you know, grown closer to, not when we were playing necessarily, mm -hmm. although he did sit behind me on the plane, on the pl different plane trips. So, you know, I'm certainly familiar and, and always know, and always knew and liked Dexter. But nowadays, you know, we, I run, was running into him more. He's been to the house, I, I don't know how many times for dinner or, you know, parties and all that stuff. So he's really become a pretty good friend of mine. Um, you know, he wasn't anybody I ran around with, you know, when I was playing. First of all, I was, you know, quite a bit older than him. And uh, so, you know, it's funny. It, it's interesting. It, let me just say it's as entertaining for me and I'm hope and I'm hopeful that it, as it is entertaining for people who watch it to actually be in Dexter's company and, and see the world through his eyes. It's it's very entertaining. And because you, you also you, you're going to talk football, you're going to talk other stuff like what is it that you know what are the topics that really kind of you, you like you feel like talking about the hunting the fixing the cars what is it that you guys like and where you really feel like hey this is just a lot of fun well some of it get comes from the fact that i grew up in northeast kansas basically in a little farming town um you know i i was in the i was in town but you know in your town of 500 i had the cattle were sleeping at night about <clears throat> 
200 yards from where I was. So I was also basically in the country. On the flip side of that, Dexter grows up in Houston, Texas in the hood. So here you have two guys, one black, one white, who from completely different cultures. And I, you know, I think that there's, you know, a lot, we find a lot of humor in the differences of where I grew up and where he grew up. Had we, uh, you know, what do you call it? Switched places, if you would, if I'd have been in the hood and he, it's kind of funny to think of Dexter in, in you know, it's the stuff that he discovers about, you know, being on the farm, yeah. things, farm people, you know, the farmers and what have you that have to deal. And it would, as it would be for me to be in the hood and deal with <laughs> things that he had to deal with. So, uh, and then, you know, in general, if there's any topic I can find, you know, fascinating, any, you know, anything, I mean, if somebody, if we had, if we had a guest on that ran a bulldozer, I'd have a thousand questions. I mean, that's, I'm an outdoor guy, basically. And you're not going to probably hear a lot of talk about, you know, this, the lawyers that did this or whatever. Medicine, of course, but for the most part, uh, business and that doesn't interest me. But, if you know, if you want to take something, you want to talk about landscaping, growing grass, whatever it may be, cutting down trees, chainsaws, you know, that, that's the kind of stuff I like to do. Well, maybe you and Dexter can eventually have one of those buddy type movies where you kind of, you know, you each go into a different place and, you know, hilarities ensue or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I it's funny you should say that because um, my wife uh, works for the USO. Um, she's the executive director here from USO Metro. And she took, Dexter was gracious enough to, to accept an invitation to go down to Quantico and be down there with the Marines. And I forget what the occasion was. But Dexter, he growing up in the hood. You know, when we start talking about guns and stuff, it's like, yeah, I don't know. I don't want to get, you know, they don't exactly turn him on. But I'm thinking, I got to figure out a way to get Dexter to go hunting. And there's something called, I think it's called, uh, not uh, Patriot Point in Maryland, which is about 300 acres. And it's, you know, it's basically a place for veterans to go. A lot of them who've been disabled in war to fish, to hunt and do all that. I'm going to figure out a way to get Dexter to go down there with me and <laughs> put a fishing rod or a, a rifle in his arms and, and see what happens. There you go. Last thing, and I appreciate your time, and I encourage people to listen and to, to check this out because I think it's a fun venture. I think fun for Washington fans. The team is playing better, so but they've always enjoyed the past, and I think especially the two of you fans still latch. They cling to you guys in a big way. But for you, I am curious, though, as you get older – how do you look back on your career? Has it ever changed the way when you look back in your career? Does it ever, does it evolve the way you look and think about it? Not really, John. I think that I, I will say based on what I told you earlier about, you know, when you get out and, and you have time alone, you, you know, you become more and more unimpressed with yourself. And I think that's kind of the way I look at what I, you know, the football thing um, that I'm kind of going, well, you know, 14 years, you did something that's, you know, I don't know exactly how to describe it other than I'm not overly impressed. I guess that's the best way. I mean, I can see it on the one hand, but there's, like I say, the objective side, I mean, sees it in a different way. I mean, it depends on, it really depends on your point of view. So it doesn't, I mean, I realized that 35 years ago, that's never who I really was. I mean, I, and I don't think I ever wanted to be pigeonholed as a football player. Um, I think basically John Kent cook when they did that, uh, when they did that uh, special, uh, was a football life. Right. I, I think that, you know, he described it best, really, when he said, well, he's a showman. And that mm. probably, if there was a word, much more so than anything else, is I'm a guy that's always went for the laugh. That's what I like to do. I don't like to take things too seriously, except for the podcast, of course, which I'd be, I'd be remiss because my uh, my partner on there, Todd Castleberry, said you can see the podcast on Facebook, yep. YouTube, and wherever you download your favorite audio pro podcast. So I thought I better get that way. Oh, I was going to ask you that, and I'm going to plug it as well. So there's no need. This will be well plugged. So because I think it's enjoyable, and again, I think fans do. I think they like to hear you just also talking about just regular things that they enjoy as well. So I think that to me is what always is part of the fun for for something like that. Yeah, well, I hope so, John. I did. And I appreciate your helping us out by spreading the word. Sure, absolutely. Thank you for coming on. I enjoyed it. I always enjoy listening to you. And so I appreciate that. Thanks, John. Okay, John. Best of luck. Thank you. Thank you. You too. After this break, I'll be back with Tyler Roman. We're talking DK Metcalf and Terry McLaurin. Support for this podcast comes from Microsoft Teams. Now there are more ways to be a team with Microsoft Teams. 
Bring everyone together in one space with a new virtual room. Collaborate live, drawing, sharing, and building ideas with everyone on the same page. And make sure more of your team is seen and heard with up to 49 people on screen at once. Learn more about all the newest Teams features at Microsoft.com Teams. You've heard me talking about Lono Coffee for a couple months now. Let me tell you a little bit about who they are and what they're about. Lono Coffee is based in the Shenandoah Valley, just a nice bunch of people who are open for business during this trying time. Just look at their website, loanoakcoffee.com, and what do they highlight? Their core values of quality, family, transparency. They work with co-op farmers from all over the world to source their beans. They also support small farmers to find the right beans. During this pandemic, one of my saving graces has been grinding my beans from Lone Oak Coffee and taking a few minutes before the day to savor the coffee, get my mind right. Put a little jazz or Frank Sinatra or Louis Armstrong on in the background, it's even better. I've enjoyed all their blends, but among my favorites, the Ethiopian Guji, love the berry flavor, the Mexican Chiapas, and their house blend. Start your day off right with Lone Oak Coffee. Visit LoneOakCoffee.com, that's L-O-N-E, OAKCoffee.com. Use promo code COFFEE2020 for a discount. You can thank me later. Welcome back. Now here's my conversation with former NFL scout Tyler Roman. All right, Tyler. Well, we're in fantasy football playoff season. So why don't you give me a few guys that maybe people should be looking at to pick up? Or to well, one guy you think, think of is uh, Kiki QT, the Texans wide receiver. Deshaun has a lot of weapons that are out right now with Brandon Cooks and Will Fuller suspended, and um, Ronald, uh, Randall Cobb is out as well. But Kiki QT had 141 yards and a touchdown two weeks ago, and this, yesterday he had a touchdown as well. So he might be Deshaun's number one option going forward. So he's a nice wide receiver three play going forward, especially in the playoffs. Curtis Samuel is another wide receiver to look at. He had 90 total yards yesterday for Carolina. He's been a pretty consistent player this last five or six weeks for them, and uh, DJ Moore is banged up for them, so he's going to get even more tar- targets potentially against a poor Green Bay defense uh, this week. If you need a tight end in a pinch, maybe Irv Smith is a possibility for Minnesota. The former Alabama player started for um, Kyle Rudolph yesterday, and he had 64 yards and a touchdown. If Ru- Rudolph's out again, I think it's another good matchup for him this week against the Bears. And then lastly, if you need a quarterback, usually you have a good quarterback if you're this far into your season in the playoffs. But Jalen Hurts might be worth a pickup. Uh, they're playing Arizona this week. But I like his matchup next week when he's playing Dallas, who everyone knows their poorest defense. Uh, he had 20 points yesterday against New Orleans, which is a pretty pretty good defense. And, you know, he provides great value with his legs. And he can get you 10 points alone on the ground. And then one little bonus one, uh, Ronald Jones is a broken pinky for Tampa Bay. So if you cut Leonard Fournette already, hopefully you didn't, or hold on to him or go get him after he was a healthy scratch yesterday. He might be a guy to go after or even LaShawn McCoy for them because if he's going to be out. They, they've run the ball a little more recently, so they're going to try to still get some carries for Fournette or McCoy going forward. How much do you think, like in Washington's case, and we don't know yet about Alex Smith, um, but how much do you think that would impact how somebody should look at these offensive skill players? Yeah, I was thinking about that. I mean, Dwayne did not play too well uh, coming in in relief yesterday. Uh, but, I mean, it's hard to come in off the bench especially for a young quarterback like that. But with a full week of practice, I think I still would be willing to start Terry McLaurin because I think he's going to get his touches even. He, he was getting numbers earlier in the year when Dwayne was starting. So I think Terry still is a safe play. Yeah, he has had a few rough spots the last two games, but that's not all of him. Get coverage is dictated the way it is in quarterback play. And J.D. McKissick, especially if Antonio Gibson now again, I'd be comfortable playing him again if he gets, you know, 10 to 15 touches like he did yesterday. And I think he'll get more this week coming up against Seattle. How, how has McKissick been as a fantasy player? Because he's, I mean, he's been, I think he's been what these guys had hoped for. Yeah, he's been awesome on the field for real life production. But even fantasy wise, he's been a really good player in the PPR league, the point per receptions, because he's getting, I think he already has 55 catches around that number this, this so far this season. So he's been more of a really good player in those aspects of the PPR leagues. But even now, I, he's worth a start in a standard league just because he's getting more carries now with Antonio out, and he's kind of splitting time with Payne Barber. But McKissick's a good runner. I think he should be getting carries even when Gibson is healthy too. So McKissick's been solid in fantasy, but he's been a revelation almost to an extent for the Washington football team this year. 
And because they, because Washington plays Seattle this week, DK Metcalf and Terry McLaurin came out at the same time. Both have been very productive. I'm curious what you, you know, have you, what you thought about DK coming out and just how these two receivers compare. You know, I had a big draft crush on DK Metcalf coming out two years ago. I always liked him. He had that really tough neck injury that caused and missed that second half of the season uh, before he came out. And that kind of hurt his draft stock as well. But, you know, obviously everyone saw we did the combine. And then as it happens, prospects get pushed down for some reason that dead time between February to April. And people are like, oh, where's three cone drill and everything like that. I mean, if you pull on the tape, you saw an explosive player. And he was getting, when he got the ball, he was tough to bring down. You saw the speed on tape. Sometimes you look at the combine and those guys, you have to look back at the tape and be like, well, what he showed out on game film is not what I saw on the combine. And DK did. I mean, you saw that speed every time he ran a go ball. I mean, he torched Alabama for his last game, his last time he played Alabama, his junior season for a 66 star touchdown, I think, in the first play of the game. And, you know, he... Always a deep third, yes. I thought he could have maybe run some more intermediate routes, but he's doing it after Seattle. I always thought he had the potential to do it. And, you know, I'm not surprised with what he what he's doing. I didn't think he'd be this good this quickly. But, you know, he when you have a guy like that that has that work ethic and, I guess, even genetics and just the way he is built, like he's he's set up for stardom. He's going to be a top 10 receiver for years to come in this league. How did you think he compared to, to McLaurin coming out? Or just and even now, how do you, how would you compare those two? I think they're different players for sure. I mean, I think even though Terry is super fast, I think obviously DK is a little more athletically gifted. I think Terry is a better route runner than DK in college and as and currently as it stands. But, you know, I just think they're different players. I, I, I like Terry coming out of Ohio State too, but they, he was just overshadowed so much by other receivers sure. on that team with Paris Campbell, and he's proven that he was the best receiver on that team so far. And – you know, I just think they were almost really differently used. And DK obviously had another great college team as well with A.J. Brown and Ole Miss. But, you know, I think, I, again, I had DK a little higher. I'm I'm surprised at what Terry's doing so far. I think what really helped Terry was that amazing senior bowl he had and people were seeing with the way he was his route running ability. Because everyone on Terry coming in was saying, oh, this guy's going to be a bona fide special teams ace at the very sure. least. And then when he came in the senior bowl and had a really nice combine, in a pro day, and that's when his stock actually, you know, really rose and got him to be in that third round consideration. And if you're redrafting now, Terry's a first round pick if you're yep. redoing that draft, and DK is as well. So, um, you know, receivers is such a hit and miss, especially the last couple of years. You got guys that are drafting the second or third round that are outshining guys in the first round. So it's almost just kind of your pick of preference the way you, the system you want or the kind of receiver you want. But, you know, those guys are bona fide stars. And I actually like DK a little more too. And it's not even really a knock on Terry, but because Terry was a five year player at Ohio State. He's a little older. He's not old by any means, but he already turned right. 25. And DK, I think, turned 23 today. So if you have guys that you like in the draft, I kind of try to tend to go the, you know, maybe another year or two younger just to see if there's a little more upside he can he can reach. But obviously Terry is proving, you know, it, it helped him. That extra year at Ohio State has made him the player he is and why he contributed from day one here in Washington. Yeah, I don't think Terry's doing this if he didn't have that last year, not because he wasn't oh, capable. He wouldn't have gotten that look. I also think he got with a really good receivers coach in Brian Hartline, and that helped him tremendously. With DK, what what's is there something that you've seen him do in the NFL that you didn't see him doing in college? And I know that it's funny because I remember going back and watching him before that draft. It seemed like he ran only two or three routes in college. Yeah. You know, that that's not a knock on him because it's also what they're asking him to do. I didn't know if he could run whatever he could, but are there some things you're seeing him do now that you may be like, Oh, I didn't see that coming. Well, I think I honestly, his run has gotten better. It, like the intermediate 10, 15 yard level, because you know, when you have that big speed threat, everyone has to, you know, protect that. So like he's breaking off his routes, better. I've seen a couple drags and comebacks that he's done where he's breaking it off his guys at 15 yards. So he can come back to the ball and he looks fluid doing it. I know everyone said he was going to be, very stiff because of his, you know, three cone drill. I think the famous one was Peyton or Peyton or Tom had a faster one than him or something like that. <laughs> obviously, it doesn't. It's irrelevant. Obviously, with DK, so I have really and true, really, you know, been intrigued with his uh, route running. And also, I'm not taking this away from DK because I think he is an amazing player. And like I said, a top ten receiver. But what really helped him is he's in the absolute perfect situation. He's in Seattle. He has Russell Wilson, great culture, great coaching staff, and he's doing great. And you have to tip your cap even a little more to Terry because he's had, what, five quarterbacks since he's yep. here. So, you know, who knows? Terry might be getting the more national stage that DK is getting right now if he's in Seattle with a guy like Russell throwing the ball. So, you know, I, I'm really excited to see them play Sunday and hopefully get both of them have a good game. But, um, 
on Sunday. Hopefully Terry has a little better one. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Tyler, thanks a lot for joining me. Thank you for having me. Support for this podcast comes from Neutrogena Hydro Boost. Does your day last all day? Keep your skin dewy, soft, and smooth all day with Neutrogena Hydro Boost. The new Hyaluronic Acid Serum quenches skin with two sizes of hyaluronic acid, dermatologist-recommended glycerin, vitamin B5, and kiwi extract. Just apply in the morning for weightless, fragrance-free hydration that reaches nine layers of skin and then seals it in for 24 hours. Or pair it with Neutrogena Hydro Boost Water Gel for four times the hydrating power. De-stress, rehydrate with premium skincare at home and on your schedule. Neutrogena Hydro Boost Hyaluronic Acid Serum. Stay dewy, soft, and drenched in hydration. Learn more at Neutrogena.com. That's it for this episode. Thanks to John Riggins and Tyler Roman for joining me. Check out Riggins' new podcast, available on many podcast platforms. And again, you can also watch it on YouTube. And thank you for listening. Got a big game coming up Sunday. I'll have on ESPN's Mina Kimes, who knows Seattle extremely well, for a look at the Seahawks, plus the national narrative surrounding this franchise. I'll talk to you Thursday.